Yeah. And I think, um, one of the things I hear a lot in terms of chatter, I don't necessarily think this is, I don't know if this is something I think maybe some people are still experiencing, um, but is the idea of, well, high intensity, I heard high intensity training is gonna, I don't know, ruin my cortisol, blah, blah, blah. Right. We hear all of these things that turn people off from doing this kind of training. And I think on the flip side, right. Oh, long, slow distance training isn't great for you, or it isn't beneficial or, you know, to your, to kind of the point we talked about earlier, oh, it's just going to increase wear and tear on your joints. And I think that there is other stuff here that gets missed over. For example, you, you mentioned the idea of how we how we cycle in and out of these intensities throughout our week. You know, how do we pair them together versus just doing five days of high intensity in a row and then we end up completely wrecked. And then also the nutritional element of that. So we've talked before about the importance of making sure you have <laughs> the adequate fuel and the recovery, um, or sorry, the building blocks for recovery, protein and so on and so forth, just making sure you're eating adequate calories. So we've talked and touched on those other things. I think when we get out onto social media, we hear these sound bites and we hear those aspects of, well, you know, high intensity training is, is bad for women in peri and post menopause because it increases cortisol. And then we're missing that that element of, oh, but that transient increase in cortisol should be fine. And in the context of these other things, right? Making sure you're managing your stress outside of that, making sure you have adequate nutrition. We're, we're missing the context around the bits of information. And I think that's kind of what I hear you saying as we're thinking about the practical application. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, things like cortisol, you know, we've Again, this is where like I get frustrated with the lack of nuance for some of these discussions. And like, yeah, probably being chronically bathed in high levels of cortisol is not great. But the acute cortisol response that you get to various different types of exercise is part of that adaptation process. It's like unfortunately for people, that is part of the hormonal mil milieu that is required for your body to adapt to the training, to get the results that people ultimately ultimately want. So, but that gets kind of missed in, in some of the some of the discussions there. I mean, you touched on the nutrition side of it, and this is where, uh, again, I think some of the, the nuance gets lost or um, the context gets lost with a lot of people. It's like you get the, you have these individuals who are either promoting or doing a lot of high intensity training which by definition, the high intensity training is glycolytic, means it requires glucose to, to perform those high intensities. That has to be your primary fuel, unless you're some freaky, freaky genetic freak who has spent years and years and years and years being able to use some degree of fat as a fuel at, at high intensities, which is almost next to nobody, you're going to you like it's a prerequisite that you're burning glucose to do your 30 second intervals or four minute intervals or whatever whatever they they happen to be those intervals for some people many people the sessions also tend to stimulate appetite now i know some people go oh my appetite is suppressed immediately after doing those it's like yep some people get an, an a degree of appetite suppression in the minutes to hours immediately afterwards but at some point down the line that appetite comes back with a vengeance and so now you you're burning all your carbohydrate off and re and creating a requirement for higher levels of carbohydrate you're creating a stimulus for your appetite either proximally to the session that you've done or distantly at some point in the hours after the session but you also want to fast and or do some form of low carbohydrate training as a low carbohydrate nutrition like those things just don't go together and if you're going to do the fasting and low carb in conjunction with a lot of that high intensity training and you're freaking out about your cortisol well you've just created a nice recipe for boosting your cortisol levels anyway because that glucose has to come from somewhere 
it's going to come from your lean muscle mass in the absence of you putting the glucose in through the hole in your face. And that requires cortisol to stimulate that gluconeogenesis process. So, you know, so again, like all of that kind of gets mixed up and, and messed up in some of the discussions that are around there for the populations that I know you work with and, and I occasionally work with too. You would be far better off once you kind of understand that mix of going, maybe if we shift more of your volume down the low intensity end in that zone two, and one of the hallmarks of zone two is that it is um, activity that occurs at the, you know, like I'm, I'm simplifying it probably potentially to the point to, of pissing a few exercise physiologists off, but um, it's the intensity at which you can maximize your fat burning. Know, the amount of fat that you can push through, flux through the, the system at, before you start to trip more over into glycolytic type exercise. So you can do low intensity volume, be more reliant on the fuel source that many people are trying to burn off their body anyway, not necessarily get such a massive appetite stimulation from that type of exercise because your can, body can buffer it a little bit, a little bit better. And it doesn't creep in kind of normal terms unless you're going out for hours and hours and hours which is a different ball game altogether but it doesn't tend to have the same sort of energy requirement in terms of carbohydrate calories that doing big long high intensity sessions or multiple high intensity sessions across a week would do so like as uh, overall for those who are just after kind of the health and longevity and want to do it in a sustainable way that's not like massively hard on their joints or there's not like a um a high skill requirement in terms of you know their ability to run at vo2 or bike at vo2 or whatever it happens to be like that that kind of low intensity mix seems to be better the, the, the low intensity balance seems to be better for those individuals in that field that we're, we're working with and that kind of health and vitality side of things that we tend to work with hmm yes I appreciate that. And we, I will link up the show notes that we've done on our podcast together on energy flux on, um, the multiple blog posts that we have about nutritional considerations. So if folks want more information on that, they can go in those, in the show notes and find those episodes and those articles. I think one thing that I hear <laughs> a ton about zone two Cardio is that it's boring and it's just, it's hard in so far as it requires one to go fairly slow. And just for anyone listening to this, you know, I've talked on the podcast earlier this year about returning to running after really a 12 year hiatus and I've done half marathons. I did marathon, obviously with triathlon, you have to run as well. So I'm no stranger to running training. And I definitely am somebody who in the past would feel in, in the past when I didn't know any better, especially if, <laughs> about training and about nutrition would feel like if I didn't go out and kind of smash myself, that it was a useless training session, right? You have to go hard or else it's not giving you a benefit. And I think we've talked about the myriad reasons why that is a bit of a faulty assumption. But nevertheless, I hear a lot of things where going out and doing zone two is boring. It feels like it's a waste of time. It's not hard enough. And I'm wondering if you can share your thoughts and advice on that for anybody who feels like they're just bored out of their skull going out for their, you know, sort of zone two type of training in their week or in their training block how do you how do you talk people through that well, I, mean, I, I always laugh when people say it's not it's not hard enough because i know from you know from i remember the, this the season of my own cycling when i said i'm like okay i'm gonna do basically a summer of proper zone two low intensity training it was like the hardest training of my life mentally because it's you you have to you have to monitor yourself all of the time and not get that creep going. And you go out on a bike and someone will come zooming past you and they kind of like bait you a little bit and look behind and see if you're going to chase them. You're like, oh, and you can't do it. You have to stay really disciplined. So from a like a mental discipline side of things, it's actually I find it way way harder to do than some of the other 
forms of training. Um, I think one of the traps that people fall into in terms of it not being hard enough, and this goes back to some of the, the points that we made right at the start of the podcast, is when people feel that they need to stick to a certain heart rate. And so they go, okay, my zone two is I have to stay under 125 beats a minute. And they suddenly start trying to run at less than 125 and they can't do that. And so like they go from a run, going, oh, like I'm still over. And they'll slow right down, they'll slow right down. They almost slow, slow down to the point that their running biomechanics is now way out compared to what it used to. They're down to a slow shuffle and it's still over the heart rate. And then they're down to a walk and you're like, oh, well, I can't even run anymore. I'm, I'm walking. But you need to keep in mind that when you first start that zone two training and particularly and this is a good indication that your aerobic engine is really not as well developed as someone might think it is is that you'll get a mismatch between your heart rate and the perceived exertion of it um and so you'll go oh like i feel like i'm going easy oh my heart rate's 145 beats still but i'm supposed to stay under 125 and so they try to keep make it easier and easier and easier. It's like, no, you don't need to do that. You need to ignore the heart rate initially and go with the feeling. Now, if you were legitimately at a three to four out of 10 for your RPE, then stick with the feeling and go with the feeling. And then over time, you'll see that heart rate from 145 to 140 to 135. It will precipitously come down as you get a, like a, I think the term is like a recoupling of kind of your, your main aerobic machinery with the actual feel of it. And I think like if people do that, then it takes away some of that element of, oh, this is like, this is quite boring because they're no longer trying to force a certain heart rate. They can just go with the, go with the feel. And I've, I've experienced that with many of my client clients, particularly the runners more so than the, the cyclists. I think it's, things are a little bit easier to regulate on the the bike than running um is that those who have just gone out and said oh i i thought my run felt easy i thought i was in the right zone but my heart rate said something completely different and i can't get my heart rate to match it and when i try it's really boring and i i hate it it's like go with the feeling mm -hmm. learn what the feeling is learn what that three is learn where your breathing should should be do the do the talk tests and everything else that go with that kind of rough zone to um, guide get that feeling right and then watch your heart rate slowly match that over time and then as they match as the heart rate kind of comes down you'll often feel that your pace will go up slightly as as well so you kind of get your pace going up like you're getting faster as your heart rate comes down for the same feeling, which is that kind of nice sweet spot triangulation of, hey, guess what? You're getting further and you're getting more efficient and you can do this for kind of sustain it for longer. So that's that That's that side of thing. I think you know, part of the, the boredom comes from people not understanding that relationship between the precedence that you give to the feeling over the heart rate. But then outside of that, I think, you know, you can you people are always struggling to find time to do certain things aren't they so you know at zone two you can then listen to your podcast you can do this you can do do that like you can utilize that time relatively well i know some this is something that you're you're very good at doing Steph. i think you probably do a lot of your a lot of your kind of catch-ups and everything else i know you've, you've sent me quite a few voice messages while you're out doing your, your zone two because you can yeah um so like you can utilize utilize that time really well the last point i'll make on that too is to get out of the mindset that um zone two has to also be long slow distance so it's like you have to go out for 45 minutes and you were sort of saying before we hit record that you know these people have this idea that zone two has to be done for 90 minutes in a session it's like no get out of the mindset of zone two occurring within the session your zone two training occurs as a total volume and you might measure it over a month or something along those lines and go okay over this month on average i could afford 
three hours a week. And so that ends up being 12 hours a month and give or take. Let's, let's make it 10 hours a month because it's easy. So how do you, like, you can then go and accumulate your volume up to that total for the month or whatever period is that happens to, to work for, for you. Now, it could be snippets of 40 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it happens to be. I know, like, there's people out there who sort of say, well, you need to get up to a minimum of 45 minutes. Well, per session. If you can, great. If you can't, is it really going to be a deal breaker? In the grand scheme of things, given that we're measuring the the adaptations and the outcomes over a really long period of time, like we're measuring like this in months and years of accumulation, not just like what's going to happen for the next couple of couple of weeks. So, you know, I I think across those three factors of go by the feeling so that you're not kind of being driven down to snail's pace by some sort of artificial heart rate target. Use the time to do other things because you can, but also don't get trapped into thinking that you need to spend hours upon hours per session doing that. I think it relieves some of that like boring training mentality that people can fall into. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought all that up. And um, I think the the sister um, rebuttal to all of that is, it feels like I'm not going hard enough. And that is that's definitely, I think that ego driven sort of, it, if it doesn't hurt, it's not giving me a benefit type of mentality that comes along with many types of training. I mean, we see that also in the strength training world, where if we think I'm not experiencing the burn in my muscles, that this type of training was useless for me. And I think that this is, this is a piece where people have to really investigate their own ego and what's driving this idea. And if, and if there's someone that trains heavily off paces that that has to, I mean, if you have to, I know it's going to be hard for some people and they would think this is sacrilegious, but leave, leave your watch at home. I mean, you could theoretically do your zone two training without your training watch, without any kind of actual yeah. feedback from the watch itself in terms of your heart rate. And it will keep the pace or set your screen to a screen that has no pace being displayed. Because if you're only concerned with pacing and all of a sudden, maybe you are having to slow down to some degree, you're seeing people passing you. I mean, I've been on zone two runs where there are literally people almost walking faster than me. And it is what it is, right? I'm I'm paying attention to also other things. And I think you mentioned talk test. Can you give the good listeners a simple definition or how they might use the talk test? Because I think I've seen, you've seen, and many of my clients have seen, this is one of the most useful things, but we just kind of poo-poo it as it's the talk test. It doesn't really mean anything. Well, um, so I think that like the reason I like the, the talk test, and this comes back to where my personal preferences are and I mentioned at the start that I use a three zone model um, and the demarcation between like zone one zone two and zone three is a ventilatory threshold which is a very kind of it's a hard physiological threshold because you know, again we won't unpack it here but the ventilation change where you go from being able to breathe relatively normally to to you suddenly cross that threshold where you do the first <gasps> like it's like mm -hmm. oh, oh shit you know like this shit just got real um, like that marks a, a, a metabolic shift that's 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 going on as opposed to a heart rate which doesn't necessarily there's always a the heart rate lag lags behind quite a bit what's going on in, internally so the talk test kind of relates to those ventilatory thresholds so at the un, if you're under what we call the first ventilatory threshold so vt1 you should in theory with your running biking climbing trees, whatever it happens to be, um, you should be able to talk in good, full, long sentences, right? You, you should be able to read the paragraph of a book if you're kind of sub VT1 or sub that first ventilatory threshold. And that would kind of, at the at the end of, end range of that, like ability to talk in paragraphs, you're probably somewhere in that, in that zone too. I mean, obviously, if you're just bimbling along and being able to talk freely you're probably not even in zone two you're in zone one so you're not 
creating enough of a stimulus for change. So it's kind of right at the very edge of what you can do in that kind of power graph test. When you cross that first ventilatory threshold and start to go into what I would call zone two, but what everyone else would probably start to call zone three, then you can no longer talk in paragraphs effectively, long sentences. You're down to kind of say one or two sentences at a time where you go, I'm going to talk like this and then I'm going to carry on. And then, you know, so you kind of, you're, you're doing these kind of catch up breaths in between your sentences. And then when you really start to push up into the, the high intensity, so what I would call my zone three, but others would start to kind of like four or five and, and six, then you're down to words. So you go from being able to talk in paragraphs to being able to talk in sentences to being able to talk in words. And then what I would say is that they're normally swear words at that point. So <laughs> fuck off and leave me alone. Like I can't talk. Um, you know, so I think that's a, yeah, it's a rough and ready, rough and ready guide. Is it exact? No. Is it perfect? No. Is it going to get you pretty close? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what most people need. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely see that as well. So I, and very much like you in trying to, this is for me personally, trying to triangulate, and you mentioned this earlier, the talk test and sort of that ventilatory quality with the overall feeling of RPE. And if anybody's unfamiliar with RPE, I will link an RPE chart. I mean, there's millions of them, but specifically uh, in this episode, so you can check out what that would, what the quality of that would de be described as. But I think most people have a pretty good sense of what a three out of four, three or four out of 10 effort would feel like. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll know when you started to slide. And then we, we also have that idea of, you know, you can look at heart rate, although it's probably less useful at the beginning, especially when you're untrained, you're completely untrained. And like you said, if you're going to go out for a run, <laughs> you're probably like, I can't actually stay in zone two. I'm over no matter what I do, which is the point at which most people tend to give up. Yeah. I will say for me, and this year really coming back into running and knowing that even though I have had some degree of cardiovascular exercise in my life in the last, people are like, oh, that's great. You started doing cardio again. I'm like, please fuck off. No, I've been doing cardio <laughs> since for the whole time. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I've not been doing more of that true steady state. And bringing that running back in pretty early on, I was like, I need to build more of that, more of my zone two back in and to see even with paces, and I'm not going to mention them because I think they're all relative, but to see how my, my pace, relatively speaking, has declined over time and how that's mirrored in what my heart rate is at those paces. And I was saying earlier, you know, I don't think pace is, is great for people who are really stuck on pace, but to see how pace has gotten faster at that zone two range and probably about two and a half minutes faster over the course of this year is pretty cool. And, and to, to your point points to the fact that even though I have been doing cardiovascular type exercise, I probably wasn't as aerobically fit as I could have been. Um, so I think that bringing up these different ways that people can learn to pay attention to their body as they are doing that training is really, really huge. Um, and when we're talking about, are you, are you in zone two? It's more of what are these different signs and signals that you're kind of where you need to be and not pushing it too hard. Because you said earlier, somebody rides by you and you're like, oh, I'm going to catch them, that little rabbit. I'm going to go and I'm going to go reel them in. Or I was out running a couple weeks ago and, um, so two women ran by me. Now the ego part of my brain would have said, all right, Steph, you have to go chase them down and you have to speed up. And I just thought, nope, I'm in my happy little bubble. I'm noticing how nice the sunlight looks this morning. I'm <laughs> you know, paying attention to the unevenness of the ground so I don't roll an ankle and fall down because I was running on the grass. And that's that, that cool spot where zone two really affords you to be is in being able to notice those things versus when I did that. I did my mile time trial, uh, in early October and I literally, you, you get into that sort of tunnel 
<laughs> We're like, I can't pay attention to anything except the fact that I feel like I'm going to die right now. Yeah. And that's that quality. So, you know, I think people do come in wanting to know an exact number. What's my exact range? What's my exact number? But to, to tie a bow on what we talked about earlier, it really is in learning to, it's in learning to learn to train is where you're going to get the most benefit. And if you, if you think you're going too fast, you probably are. You probably need to, you probably need to go a bit slower. And I think that's the the people, the part that people have a tough time with. Oh, absolutely. And, and you, you kind of hit the nail on the head earlier of saying it's, it's ego and we get a lot. We've got a lot of the tech that's available to us now reinforces that ego in some way, shape or form, whether it's, you know, some sort of acknowledgement on your Garmin or whatever other device that, you know, you're, you're at kind of some sort of PB pace, whether you were on Strava and then Strava kind of tells you you've got a KOM or QOM. Um, I know I like, I've worked with the people who use the calories burnt as a marker as well. And so, you know, they'll, they'll go and do a 30 minutes at zone two and then go 30 minutes at zone three and go see like I've burnt like X number of more calories at zone three, I should be doing this. And and, and apart from the inaccuracy of, of all of that, you know, it just kind of fuels that desire to go harder. Um, you know, the, the endorphins, the huffy puffiness, the sweatiness, the burn, like all of those things that we've been kind of conditioned over years and years and years within the fitness industry as markers of some sort of success or doing better and we we need to kind of unlearn a lot of those things when it comes to doing this like low intensity high intensity split i mean the 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 other thing that kind of comes into that is is if you if you fall into that creep of going from zone two up into the the zone three for the sake of ego or whatever it happens happens to be that's driving you there you very very quickly end up in no man's land with your training overall because the your easy sessions no longer become easy and so you kind of go oh like i'm doing zone two but i feel like i feel good today so i might just push the pace or i'm feeling a bit fat today so i might just push the pace or whatever it happens to be so you start doing more and more zone three instead of zone two that builds a level of fatigue which can be fairly innocuous at the start like you might not necessarily notice that much of a difference but you know, it stacks fatigue on top of fatigue so that when it comes time to do your high intensity work, whether within that week or a month down the track or whatever, there's now so much fatigue in the system that you can't either get up into those high intense, high intensities or you can't stay up there and sustain them. And so you end up kind of dropping back slightly. So if we're to use the zone model, your zone two becomes a zone three and your zone five you might kind of peak up into five, but you very quickly kind of drop back into low zone four type efforts overall. And so your your easy days become too hard and your hard days don't become hard enough. And then and you just don't you end up getting nowhere. Your pace stagnates, your performance stagnates, your body composition stagnates. So I think it's a like it's a really good skill for people to learn to check their ego and find other ways of making that kind of easy work easier. I mean, I, I know with my clients, and you, you said this earlier on, that the, the tech can lead us astray. Like I've I've put my foot down with a couple of my clients who kept on getting wrapped up in their pace. So my pace was, I went out and did my easy work, but my pace was so much slower than what it should be for 20 kilometers or whatever it is they had to do. And I'd like just put my foot down and go, take the watch off. Like the your sessions are now like no tech sessions. I don't want any watch. It's just drive by feel. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. So mentioning just sort of how I've seen my pace has, has increased at that sort of same zone too, but it's still not something I'm driving toward. It's kind of that after effect, you know, I'm sort of seeing, okay, after several months of doing this, I am noticing that I am improving my efficiency in this heart rate zone, but it's, it's a, it's a byproduct. And so when I'm going out, I'm also paying huge attention to how do I feel 
um, my, my ventilatory rate for sure. And I know, I know if I'm honest with myself, I know when I'm, you know, creeping up and, and it's no longer kind of an easy session. It's so funny. One of my clients, when I was back in Massachusetts, visiting my family, I posted a video of, of me out running in the woods. And she said something like, you always seem so happy when you're running. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's because a lot of the times I'm running, I'm running, I'm running slow. It's relaxed. It's fun. And I think sometimes we forget that training That's can be, yeah, training, training, cardio can be fun. It can be somewhat relaxed. It doesn't have to be a suffer fest every time we go out. And I think that that's that inclination over time for some people. And it was definitely me when I was a cyclist, if I wasn't out suffering, I felt like I wasn't doing myself any good, which is <laughs> very naive <laughs> looking back that I think for, for people that are looking for um, a fast result or people who are tying a bit of their worth to their performance in that way can, can become a bit of a slippery slope. Yeah. I mean, and there's, I mean, we, we have to acknowledge that there are, there are definitely going to be those personality types who are motivated by the competition, you know, whether it's competing against others or competing against themselves in some way, shape or form, which you can do. Like I'm, 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 well and behind the idea of people going out and doing uh benchmark runs or rides or, or again whatever it happens to be so like find a course of a known distance and go and test yourself on it early and then retest yourself on it every four weeks or six weeks or something along those lines and you know but in between times you know those are the those are the the testing testing times but in between times do the bulk of your training unplugged without the tech or at least, you know, disguise the tech and you can check in the check in on the numbers later. Um and and get the competition that way or find other elements within what it is that you're doing to be competitive about other than just the pace or just the intensity of which you can you can push yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um so I think it makes sense to start wrapping this one up <laughs> two hours later. But, you know, again, if somebody is more on the recreational side of things, they're generally looking to improve their cardiovascular fitness, their stamina, you know, they want to be able to use that fitness in life, not just for the pursuit of a particular sport. And, and, you know, we've, <laughs> we've got tons of resources for sports specific stuff out there. But if somebody is more in that camp where they're maybe not doing a lot of cardio, if any, what are some broad brush strokes you would recommend for that person to just kind of break the seal and make things less daunting? Because again, I think sometimes in, in these populations of folks that we're talking to, if we're talking to those high level competitors or those people who really love training, they're like, I need to go train. But we also have the the other pool of folks who are thinking, you know, yeah, I'm in my forties now. I, I, I know it's important for me to have a strong cardiovascular system. I know that this is going to help me be better at life and the things that I want to do. How do we make this concept more approachable for that pool of people? The, I think the first thing I'd probably do with that call is, again, probably try and get them out of that seven-day cycle mindset of that they need to kind of cram a whole lot of stuff into a seven-day repeating cycle. Because there's, again, there's so much that they often need to work on. Like, you know, their, their aerobic capacity might be relatively low. And yes, they need to do the work to build that. But then also their strength might be low and they've got to spend some time on their mobility and they've got to spend some time on their nutrition. So there's so many moving parts that they need to work on. So elongate the training cycle as it were. So I would, with those individuals, I can kind of push them out maybe to a two-week block and go, okay, you're going to fit all of the different parts in over a two-week repeating cycle. And the first two weeks could be um 
doing kind of exclusively low intensity work or the first four weeks or first six weeks exclusively doing whatever modality of low intensity work that they happen to, to gravitate towards. But then after that, you could then start to slowly drip feed in one low intensity session within that block and, and that session itself happens to be low volume. And over time, you might make that single session that they're doing, say they only do three high intensity intervals of whatever duration, say three by four minutes, just to pick an easy example. Then the next time they might go four by four minutes and five by five minutes. So like make that session, um, extend the session, so make it more extensive. And then when you get out to a point where, I don't know, they've, they're now doing 30 minutes of high intensity intervals in the session and they're handling it well. And in between times, they're still doing all of the other low intensity work. Then you might be able to add an additional session somewhere within whatever their their cycle is. So then like over time, you're slowly building this up and, and elongating it out. And they might do that for three months, six months, a year of just increasing the um, the number of intervals that they're doing within a session, increasing the number of sessions that they do within their block, but still not like trying to add more and more and more to a seven day cycle. Then after a time, they might go, you know, they're starting to build a, rel a relatively good base now. Then they could take the mindset of doing more um, either what we call it, say accumulation blocks. So it could be now we're going to try and increase the volume if they've got the time of their easy training. And then they might do an intensification block. So it's like, okay, we're going to do a short, sharp two weeks of actually relatively high frequency, high intensity work. But then once you come out of that intensification block, then you just go back down into low intensity for a period of time. And again, you can slice and dice that in many ways. But it's getting people into that mindset of you don't just go from zero drop into uh, almost I say a 50 50 split of low intensity or high intensity or whatever else it is and just slowly kind of stack things up over over a long period of time but you're not doing it in a seven day cycle we're just trying to shoehorn everything in, and then people kind of run out of time and run out of energy to to make it all fit but that's for me that's the biggest barrier I come across for for people is they they know that they need to do their strength and their low intensity and their mobility and this and this and this and this. And they just, life gets in the way as it would do because they're not, that isn't their life. They're not professional athletes. So, okay, we'll just, let's just elongate that time frame, And then it mm -hmm. may, it, I, I think that elongation of the time frame lowers the entry barrier for a lot of people because they just don't feel that they have to ram everything in such a short period of time. Yeah. I think that's a huge takeaway. And and also one of the challenges in reconceptualizing how we think of time, because <laughs> we do think everything has to be done on the weekly. And, you know, to your point, we're not just, we don't just make improvements in terms of a week, right? We're talking about these long-term adaptations. One of the biggest things that I like to recommend if people already walk is put on a weight vest or a ruck and do what you're already doing, just sprinkling in a little bit more of that intensity through adding load, knowing that it's not the same as strength training. So don't even, don't even try, <laughs> don't even try to tell me that you're strength training. Cause now you're rucking a couple times a week. And yep. I've talked about that on a recent podcast too, but it is a nice way to like habit stack. So I think sometimes too, we think if we already have something that we like to do, that we have to do something completely different. And, you know, it, it could be as simple as taking something you're already doing and, you know, maybe go walk up some hills. I don't know if you live in Florida and you have no hills around you, maybe you put on a rock <laughs> or something like that. But it's also that idea, I think, for folks to not necessarily introduce new things, but find a way to repurpose something that they already like. You know, if you are somebody who likes dancing, I don't know, you like to dance and go to dance class and that's pretty relaxed is, can you, can you get in there and really throw on some high, some high, some fast paced music and, you know, you, you really go to town. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, but, um, the, the strict definitions, I think that's a, a theme of this episode is those strict definitions, those strict 
you just tell me what, I, where I need to be and how I need to stay there and how I achieve it can end up doing more disservice than, than they do good. I mean, I, I know, um, you know, for the cycling population, and again, this is, you know, just as much to the recreational cyclists as it is to the, to athletes, to those who, um, because in New Zealand, where I no longer live, the, the weather is relatively temperate most of the year. So it does allow a little bit more of this, um, type of behavior but like using the bike for your commute to and from work you know so like if you're on your way to work you don't want to arrive at work all hot and sweaty so you like just dial back the intensity to zone two then you're fine so that actually is one of my uh women who i'm working with at the moment and she's semi-elite-ish cross-country mountain biking we've spent the last few months building her zone two base just with her riding to and from work she rides 45 minutes each way. So it's like, there's no point in, she's already doing that. It's a, it's a thing that she is already doing. And in many, for her at least, it was a case of, of dialing back the intensity and not drag racing herself to, to work. We're not going too hard on, on her way to work. So using what she is doing already to build that, that kind of zone two um, volume. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of mentioned dancing and, you know, it can be many other different forms of, of movement. I'd, I'd be kind of interested to hear what your experience is um, doing the BJJ, but I'll, I would sort of say a good portion of that kind of continuous skill work that you might do would get relatively close. If you kind of looked at the totality of the session, it'd be relatively close to being in that kind of zone two type area. Um Again, I guess it, like it depends on exactly what you're working on. So there, there can be different forms of um, movement that people might be involved with, which you know does add up over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with BJJ, that's a tough one because there are, is so variable, and there's also some interesting factors. So obviously, if you are <laughs> sparring with another person, you can't always control the pace probably harder to learn to control the pace when you're newer as somebody who's more experienced. So if people don't know, I'm a brown belt in BJJ, which means I've been there for six and a half years and that's one level below a black belt. So I would say, although I am not under the illusion that <laughs> I know everything, I know enough of the basics to, to hold my own. So if I am rolling with someone newer, I can generally control the pace because I know how to do that. If I'm a newer person, I might not necessarily know how to control the pace if someone's really pushing that pace. There's also movement economy. So when you're newer, you're just running around. You're just, <laughs> you're just running around. You have no idea what to do, how to pass the guard. And so you tend to be a lot less efficient in your movement versus now being more efficient in movement economy means sometimes I'm moving less, but accomplishing more. And controlling the strategy of the game. That being said, you know, sometimes things are moving really, really fast. And those tend to be in intervals because we train for six minutes at a time. So I just find because of the variability and over the years I've seen, yes, I have become more efficient at the game, but it's a different type of stimulus. And let's be real. A lot of jujitsu is done while you're lying on the ground. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's like, it's, 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 the thing that kind of came to my mind was you know, <laughs> I, had, like, I had a brief involvement with um, Kung Fu, which, you know, you're doing a lot of line drills and you're up and down and you're doing your patterns and everything else. So you're kind of on your feet, effectively, like dancing in pajamas. Um, and, you know, that's when you're kind of doing that for 20 minutes at a time, you're you know, you're probably up into a relatively low zone zone two type thing. It's yeah, probably yeah. less spiky than what um what BJJ is in that regard. Yeah, I would say it, it's going to depend, right? The first half of class, if we're doing more drill focused instruction, for the most part, that's pretty relaxed. In in you know, you're doing the technique, you're practicing back and forth with your partner, you regroup as a group, you're watching the instruction, you're breaking up again into partners and and repeat for you know 40, 30, 40 minutes. And then maybe we're sparring four rounds. It depends. Saturday, we might do eight rounds. And so at the beginning, could I even fathom doing eight straight rounds? No way. 
And so I would see that, of course, and I came from several years off of any kind of endurance training, weightlifting almost exclusively for a while, Olympic weightlifting, and then kind of adding jujitsu in in 2017. So at the beginning of that point, I was pretty detrained, pretty deconditioned, even from when I had left CrossFit into then. So that was about a four year gap. And there's no way I could have done eight, six minute rounds. No way I could have done that. And so I would sit, you know, roll a couple, sit a couple, roll a couple, sit a couple. Now I can do eight straight rounds. And generally speaking, unless I'm going with a black belt, (laughs) who's really, really turned the screws on me. um, I can walk away from that eight, six minute round day feeling relatively okay and and not completely decimated. So there I think there's that adaptation over time. I do think that BJJ athletes would benefit greatly from again polarized polarizing training because we do a fair amount of really hard out of breath type of stuff, but we also do a lot of lying down on the ground in our pajamas and <laughs> <laughs> it can look to the casual observer. Like there's not a lot going on sometimes when I, I film myself and I'll film different rounds to kind of see what I'm doing. And in some cases for some of the lower belts to see if there's any pointers for them, I see how much slower I'm moving on film as opposed to what it seems like in my mind. So I have tons of data on my whoop to, to sort of, sort of show me roughly where I might be in any given round. But again, it's, it's your point. It feels relaxed. And so there are a lot of sessions where I'm not even getting into zone two period anymore. So it, part of it is, can I increase the intensity if I needed to? Probably I could push the pace, but also just by the nature of the variety of what we do in class, sometimes we're, we're not really pushing. So I do think at the end of the day, it, it does come down to that. You know, we could probably stand to do both higher and lower intensity. Tra- I think uh, like, imagine that higher and lower intensity has benefit work them into your week in a way that's smart or your, your 14 day period that's smart and benefits, you know, not just what you're doing in training, but your lifestyle and, and doesn't become a burden to recover from pair it with some solid nutrition, lift your weights. And there you go. <laughs> too much common sense. No one will ever buy it. No, it's, it's too, it's too measured and balanced, you know, it's not extreme enough. Um, but yeah. you know, I, I, <laughs> I think that's where social media does come back around and for, you know, lack of a better term, polarizing things are popular, you know, big, bold claims, things that seem really absolute are easier to share because there's not a, well, it does depend. And here's some nuance behind it. And you need the context, that kind of content, which you and I share a lot of, isn't as it, it doesn't, it doesn't get the clicks. It doesn't get the clickbait. It's not inflammatory. It's kind of the opposite of that. And it's, it's just the the metered perspective and the, the the discussion that isn't going to catch someone's attention in two and a half seconds. No, and I mean, and it's it requires people to do a little bit of uh, reflection and thinking about you know, where they're at, what they're doing, or what their context context is. And yeah, you know, I think people's attention spans and lives and busyness often don't allow for that so you know the 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 simple one-liner of just do this at this intensity because you are this flavor person or that flavor person is way easier message to sell but Mm -hmm. absolutely any last thoughts anything we didn't touch on that you want to make sure we get in um i mean i think like just based on some of the the recent commentary that we've we've seen and and um comments and confusion that has gone with that is i mean i would just encourage people to remember that they're human beings first male and female second um and that a lot of what we do know and understand around the kind of physiology of of our training and and what seems seems to work 
holds true for both men and, and women. And then you might just kind of, you know, nudge the dial one way or the other. But again, probably more based on other contexts before you get to kind of too wrapped up in the, the sex differences um, overall. So I think like, I, you know, I would just kind of finish up with sort of saying that in, in the, in relation to some of the, the kind of more recent discussion around this is people just need to kind of maybe slow down a little bit and not get too lost in the hype around sex-based training no matter what what type it happens to be and, and just kind of realize that um there's there's just kind of some some set um principles that apply to apply to everyone first and foremost and mm -hmm. you know, sex differences will be you know way down the down the list of the hierarchies that you've kind of come to first absolutely similarly with we've talked about this ton nutrition you know, what's your, 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 what are your nutritional priorities? And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're operating in low energy availability chronically, that that's probably one of the biggest issues that you need to solve before you start thinking about how you're going to vary your carbohydrate intake in your luteal phase versus your exactly. follicular yeah. phase, you know? So I get it. It's, it's, it's one of those things, right? We don't, necessarily have a balance of those sort of sex differences in terms of the research currently. So it's this really exciting area to investigate. And at the same time, you know, with training, with nutrition, we know that there are the, going to be those priorities that are probably going to come first and foremost before we start dissecting it up. And, you know, for the majority of, of user of, of use cases of users, you know, if, if we're operating at the very, 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 very highest levels, perhaps some of those more high tier kind of top of the pyramid things become more important, but at the same, you know, we're trying to eke out those last couple percentage points of performance, which could be the difference between world records and Olympic medals and those sorts of things. But this, the basics still apply. And, and I think that's where we had to remain grounded in these discussions as well. And in the recommendations and the practical takeaways that people leave with. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, you refer to the pyramid, that kind of a, a hierarchy of means type pyramid. I mean, the base of that pyramid for, um, cardiovascular endurance type training is just ensuring you're getting enough volume overall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you and I both come across people who are getting kind of lost in the the, the minutiae and the details of what's further up that, that pyramid. And we go, well, actually, are you are you doing enough training? Oh, no, I can't really because this, 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 and this. It's like, well, there's your, there's your first port of call. Like, you, you just need to be able to kind of create the environments and the habits and structures in your life to allow you to go out and do something no matter what the intensity is before you kind of get lost too much in the the detail of how you distribute that intensity based on star sign flavor. Of person, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I always think you kind of have to know the rules before you can break the rules. And it's, it's kind of that idea, right? As if, if we're hitting the basics and we're doing the basics well, then, and only then, might it be a great discussion to say, how do we further tweak to optimize? And I think that optimization, the rush to optimize supersedes in many cases, the drudgery oftentimes and the hard stuff of putting the base into practice and doing those foundations very well over time, such that we have now opened up opportunity to say, okay, do we want to optimize things now? But everybody's in such a rush to optimize these days and biohack and all of these things that we're, we're sort of blowing past the base that would bring us, you know, those, those, those are those big rocks. Those are those big gears that are going to turn, that are going to give us probably more adaptation and more benefit, but we're in such a rush to do, to, to look for the shiny, to look for the what's newest and best. And we kind of forget, you know, the old reliable, boring basics. And if we were able to turn our attention back to those 
and get support when we need it to implement that behavior change, to build the systems and structures, to set up the environments. And I think that's where you and I come back to the importance of coaching and the importance of guidance and the importance of support is in redirecting back away from the shiny and in the, the, the tippy tippy top. And, you know, it's the same question of like, well, what is my supplement split? You know, what does that have to, what, what, what can I take to optimize my performance? And I'm looking at the base of what clients are doing. And I'm sure you're doing the same and thinking first we got to maybe eat, eat enough food and sleep a little bit more. And then, <laughs> you know, down the road, we can talk about those higher level things. And it's, it's just not what is sexy and what's popular oftentimes. Very well said. Very well said. <laughs> All right. Very well said. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Any, any last thoughts? Um, where do you want folks to follow along with your, your posts and the things that you're putting up online? And if they're interested in coaching, where can they get a hold of you? This, this is showing me up as a proper amateur because it's like, uh, well, the only place to follow me now is on my Instagram feed cool. as he reaches for his phone because I couldn't <laughs> tell you oh, what my Instagram handle is off the top of my head. Uh, well, what have I changed it to recently? It is jamiescott.nz. Okay. <laughs> even, though I, even though I'm not an NZ. All there right. Cool. So we'll make sure we link that up. And also we'll link up the other episodes that we had in the past so folks can take a listen to all of that this has been a great discussion i'm so grateful that you're here with me to have it and to present you know the the other side of the coin the the how do we how do we implement this how do we look for the practical application that goes hand in hand with all the other stuff that we're learning and all of the other bits of the puzzle because ultimately that's where I think people get the most confused, the most overwhelmed and truly need the most support. So I appreciate you being here and, and talking through it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. We, we won't leave it quite so long next time. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks.